talking today all about biophilic design. My name is Mark Brown. I'm from TG Escapes. We provide uh, eco buildings throughout the education sector in the UK. Uh, and I thought today it would be interesting just to look at um, biophilic design because we've done a fair amount of, of work in, in understanding the benefits that it can bring uh, to, to, to uh, occupants, to students, to teachers. Um, and now more than ever, it feels that with the mental health crisis that we're facing, uh, there are small things that can be done uh, in any school to help with the mental well-being of staff and students. So today I'm going to be talking about um, some of the research behind biophilia and how it works, <clears throat> some of the things that you can do easily and some of the things which you can do less easily, uh, and share some of the research from independent sources and our own research which looks at how people benefit from working in buildings which have biophilic elements. So without further ado, I'm going to share my screen. Hopefully you can all see that clearly. If you have any, um, any questions as we go, I'll try and keep my eye on, on the chat box or we'll probably um, save them till the end and have a Q&A at the end. But pl please feel free, if there's anything that you'd like to ask as you go, I'll do my best to, to, to see it. But if not, then we'll pick it up, uh, pick it up as I say, when, uh, towards the end when we have the Q&A. So um, I mentioned <clears throat> in my introduction, everybody is very aware of a mental health crisis in our young people across the country. Um, there was a mental health crisis before the pandemic, and it only seems to have exacerbated that. This is just some of the more recent research that, that's, that's looked into this. So this is um, some data from Bernardo's. They have a, an ongoing research study, The Big Conversation 2020, and they found that a third of young people between the age of 18 to 24 have reported an increase in mental health and well-being issues. Uh, young minds uh, also do some some continuous research and they found that 67 percent of 13 to 25 year olds believe the pandemic will have a long-term negative effect on their mental health and amongst young people with existing mental health difficulties they found that 83 percent had experienced worsening mental health during the pandemic so we have a crisis and it's a long-term crisis and when thinking about the spaces that we're creating for our young people uh, to, to learn in, uh, to be in, then thinking about the things we can do to help alleviate some of this mental stress uh, is, is got to be a good thing. Now this is um, a piece of research from, uh, this is an extensive study done in Denmark across a massive data set where they looked at a group of children, they looked at a, a huge group of children in the population, and they found that children who grew up with greener surroundings have up to 55% less risk of developing mental disorders later in life. So it's, it's for me, it's a first sign that, you know, being green, being, being exposed to nature, being close to nature is, is fundamentally good for us. So my, my suggestion is that we all need nature. You know, we all, we all know how, how well refreshed we can be from taking a walk in the woods or sitting in the garden. And um, in a 1989 paper, Rachel Kaplan suggested the theory that nature can provide a restorative effect um, to attention after mental fatigue. So it can be fundamentally restorative and a few minutes in nature can make a big difference to your mental state. So she called this the biophilia hypothesis, and, and the theory suggests that there's a real fundamental tendency of humans to focus on and affiliate with, with nature. It's genetic, it's built into us, and it's no great surprise when you think about you know, where, when, when mankind um, first started standing, standing upright, we were, we, were, we were living in nature, we, we were predisposed to be aware of nature, our, our fight or flight um, uh, aspect is, is driven by living in nature and, and being, you know, being fearful of animals that might come and have us for lunch. 
So, so we know that our DNA, our, the, way, the way that we're built, the way our bodies work, um, it is fundamentally connected to, the, to nature and, and, and interacts with, with, with the planet in, in quite a unique way. Now, at the moment, we are going through one of the most rapid technological revolutions in history, as we all know. And, and so we've got this extra effect of the impact of technology. But technology isn't all bad. And, and um, we, we know we've got to live with technology, but it, but it does have it does play a play a, have a factor, if you like. It has a bearing on how um, how we need to how we need to think about compensating for it. And I looked at um, uh, this is a UNICEF study that actually did reviewed a lot of the research studies that, that have been taken placed into technology. And what they found is that moderate use of technology can actually be beneficial to mental well-being. Um, but no use or high use can be detrimental. So it's not that, that using technology is fundamentally bad. And of course, that's a good thing. And in fact, technology can have a positive impact on social relationships. But it's a fact that time spent on screen does leave less time for physical activity. And in the old days, uh, when, children, when children were playing, they'd be playing out, they'd be playing outside and getting that physical activity instead of perhaps now spending time on screens. And I think what the lockdown has shown is how important technology is going to be for us in education um, going forward, even more important perhaps than it has been in the past. But I think that means that we need to compensate for that screen time and help to try and replace the nature deficit that is being created by spending a bit more time on screen. So coming on to biophilia, well, what is biophilia? Um, I'm assuming if you're here today, you've probably got some idea uh, of biophilia, otherwise you're unlikely to be here. But it's it's derived from, from the Greek uh, bio, meaning life, and philia, um, something like brotherly love, friendship, affection. And the principles of biophilia really go way back to, 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 um, to ancient civilizations, where when you think about how buildings were constructed, they were all built around open air courtyards in the center. Uh, and, the, and these were really there to provide a place of, of rest, calm, fresh air, natural light, and views of nature. So the, the, the principle of biophilic design has been with us um, really, really forever. So this is from um, uh, uh, Vivia's uh, Why Nature is Good report, the, bi the biophilia hypothesis. And what it, what it says is that biophilia works in a number of, on a number of different levels. It, worked for, it works for us developmentally. So exposure to nature enhances our cognitive function, emotional and, and moral development, discovering the self. Um, and, it, and it's continuous from childhood into adulthood. It also works with us emotionally because the emotion of awe um, especially leads, leads to uh, ego trans transcendence, humbleness and oneness with nature um, and, and a feeling that the world is, is, is good in both its enlightening and its terrifying effects. So awesome, awesome aspects of nature big views kind of kind of work uh, as well as as well as some of the more reassuring familiar connection with nature and environmentally it's important fascination with the non-human environment can be restorative um, people find it calming it leads to contemplation and reflection uh, many people that I work with um, they, 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 they talk about they'll often go out for a walk uh, when they need to solve a problem or they need to relax or they need to uh, they need to improve their, their mental state or change their state. So that's the principle of biophilia. But what is biophilic design? Well, um, Stephen Kellett was a, was a pioneer of biophilic design, and he created a framework of principles that a lot of people have used since. <clears throat> and what it, what it basically says is that there are those direct experiences of nature, things like light, air, water, uh, natural landscapes, the weather. And there are indirect experiences, and these can be images of nature. There can be natural materials in a room, natural colours, simulation of natural light and air, naturalistic shapes and forms that evoke nature and, 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 um, and biomimicry. So, so there's the direct experience of nature and then there's re replicating nature, if you like, in, in more graphical forms or more physical forms. So when we think about biophilic design principles, there are three core areas that have been identified. I've taken this from, uh, from human spaces. And they define it, um, and, and I don't know whether this is their definition or, or there's other people that use it as well. Um, they define it as nature in the space. And this means things like sunlight, flow of fresh air, 
pot plants and green walls, um, water. And secondly, there's the nature analogues. And these are shapes, patterns, uh, natural colors, natural materials, photography and artwork. And then there's nature of the space. And this is really about how spaces are shaped and designed. So it's the configurations of buildings or the spaces that you're in. So for example, um, cozy nooks, wide open uh, expansive spaces, meandering corridors. Now, the first two of these are, I would, I would suggest, are principles that can be adopted into any education setting because you can bring these into existing buildings, existing spaces, relatively simply and relatively cheaply. When it comes to the third one, of course, then this is about designing uh, spaces. So, so obviously for new buildings, when you, when you think about a new building, then, then this is relevant. But the first two are relevant whether you're working with existing spaces or new. So how can biophilic design enhance development for our young people? Well, it's been shown to work in a number of different ways. So first of all, sensory motor development. So adding, adding sensory elements from the natural world can inspire curiosity and imagination and discovery. Um, it can address stress and fatigue. So um, often stress is, is caused by noisy open plan classrooms and this can be reduced with exposure to nature. It can help with cognitive ability and emotional well-being um, because these can both be significantly, significantly increased by embedding nature into learning environments. And when it comes to attention spans and ADHD behaviours, then classrooms that, that, that use biophilic principles um, offer, stim, offer significant benefits. So um, it's been shown to improve attendance, produce higher test scores, improve behaviour, increase focus. I'm just going to quickly run through some of the, some of the evidence for this. So um, connected with nature enhances development. This is from a study by Sigmund uh, quite some time ago now, but it showed that children exposed to nature scored higher on concentration, self-discipline, improved awareness and reasoning, better in reading, writing, maths, better at working in teams and showed improved behaviour overall. Um, uh, this is um, data from Human Spaces, a paper published in 2015, showing that Optimising exposure to daylight, just, just more exposure to daylight, can improve attendance by up to three and a half days a year, test scores by five to 14 percent and increase speed of learning. They found that having plants in classrooms can improve spelling, mathematics and science performance. So just natural light and plants can have a big impact on, on students in the classroom. And there's more evidence that connecting to nature improves educational outcomes. Um, a large study by um, Hershon Mahon Group showed that just having larger windows improved progress in maths and reading significantly. And having views of nature, of course, um, where schools are located with, with natural surroundings, this is all very well in urban environments, less so. But natural views can produce higher test scores, graduation rates, uh, more people attending college and fewer reports of criminal behaviour. That was a study in the University of Michigan. This is a, an interesting study about the role of, of materials. And um, uh, as, as, a, as a provider of timber frame buildings, we're, we're interested in the properties of timber, not, not just in its construction properties, but actually in its effect on the space that you're creating. And this is a study by... Um, uh, Weitzer Parkett in the UK, the School Without Stress study. And what they wanted to do here was they wanted to understand the impact of using timber in classrooms versus traditional classrooms. And they measured the heartbeats of the occupants in a standard classroom and the heartbeats of occupants in a timber classroom. And what they found was over the course of a day, they were having up to eight, eight and a half thousand heartbeats less per day. Um, which is, which is indicative of lower stress, being calmer, uh, basically being happier and, and more well. Another point which um, I think is important is that uh, 
we, we, we're seeing um, increasing uh, increases in, in incidence of myopia. And what's interesting about this is from the from the end of the 19th century, so so throughout throughout um, um, the early 20th century until the 60s, good daylighting in schools was 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 designed in to prevent myopia. And education departments built built schools with large windows and specified minimum daylight levels in order to protect children's sight. And in fact, one of the reasons why putting playgrounds and open spaces around schools was 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 to directly address um, and prevent myopia. But since the 60s, the incidence of myopia has doubled in Europe <clears throat> and in the US. Um, so, so thinking about these biophytic principles um, is not only good for perhaps you know, our, our mental well-being and physical health, but actually uh, our eyesight as well. So another, another reason to be considering the importance of natural light. So that's quite a lot of different studies, different evidence, and there's a load more out there. But it's interesting to ask what, what's going on? Why does this work? Why, why is it that, that nature can have such a positive impact on our well-being and educational outcomes on our eyesight? <clears throat> so this is um, a study by Lewis and Bessel in 2012. And um, when sitting and staring at a, a screen or, 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 um, or, or using our short-term focus, the eye's lens becomes rounded and contracts and the eye muscles contract. Um, and when they stay contracted for 20 minutes or more, then fatigue occurs and, and that's where you get headaches and physical discomfort. And what they, what they suggest is that if, if a brief, a brief, and it needs to be a brief a visual distraction for more than 20 seconds from a distance of 20 feet, allows for short mental breaks. And when you do that, the muscles relax. So, so there's a very physical um, benefit from having large wider views, changing views, having different things to look at in order to break up the way that our eyes are working and reduce that physical discomfort. So that's, that's one point. There's um, <clears throat> a theory called attention restoration theory. And I'm quoting this from um, Terrapin Bright Green. And they, they argue that there's lots of research showing that um, the benefits of nature are practically instant, kicking in within seconds. And they argue that this is due to something that, they, that, that we call fractal fluency. And this is basically about ourselves, our bodies, our human beings, recognising shapes and patterns in nature and being reassured by them. So when we see fractals <clears throat> in the built environment, perhaps it could just be prints in carpets or wallpaper or in, or in shades, then the brain, the brain is, is naturally predisposed to process that easily, it kind of recognise it, it makes, it makes sense of it. And that lowers our stress response. So the natural elements really can restore mental energy and enhance creativity. And it engages different parts of the brain than the part used for short bursts of focus. So it gives the brain the opportunity to reset. So it's that it's that kind of innate recognition of natural shapes and colours <clears throat> that has a big impact on the way our brain's working. Now, you can go on the internet and you can search biophilic design, and there's so many fantastic projects all around the world. Um, I just thought I'd just pick, just pick a couple just to illustrate how different groups are, are taking this very seriously. So the first one up there on the right is the doctor's surgery in New York. Um, and and they've, they've basically taken, I'm sure you're familiar with, you know, your, your experience with doctor's surgeries in the UK are generally relatively sterile, being kept clean. Um, They've taken a very different view here, which is they wanted to intersperse nature throughout. And they wanted to create comfort, intimacy and healing and empower people to engage with health from the moment they walk in the door with the argument for creating a doctor's surgery full of plants, full of biophilic principles. So that's very directly related to health and well-being. Similarly, over on the left here, the um, Oslo University Hospital um, <clears throat> created 
uh, a, 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 a retreat area um, where patients could go to spend time in a wooden environment with views of nature, soft, soft shapes, irregular shapes. Um, and there's lots of examples of biophilic design being used in restorative healthcare. Um, and Dr. Esther Sten Sternberg um, claims that hospital patients with a view of trees require few pain, fewer pain meds than patients with a view of a brick wall. So this is something that she's found in over experience over time, that providing views of nature actually improve uh, the, the, the health directly or of patients. And then finally, just to say that biophilic design is used, it's already used in a number of schools, uh, some, some incredible designs around, around the world and some in the UK. Um, but it doesn't have to be, you know, it doesn't have to be a, a whole school site. This is, this is an example of, of, a, of a biophilic project at Muswell Hill um, Primary School, and this is called their ARC. And it's just an organic shape made of timber um, with seating reminiscent of a, of a park picnic scene. So it's, so it's, it's giving, giving cues to nature and the natural world. But as I say, I could, I could spend all day showing examples of biophilic design. They're all out there on the internet. Um, but these, these are just some examples of where people, people are really believe in the power of, of biophilic design to help. So the question is how to incorporate biophilic design at my setting. So if you're working in a school, um, at any level, what you know? How, how how could I bring it in? Well, there's two there's two areas to explore here, which we'll, we'll go into now. The first is what can you do in existing spaces? So what can you do? Um, there are, there are lots of things you can do that are simple, cheap, and very easy to achieve. Um, so I would argue that anybody could tomorrow introduce some biophilic principles into their learning space. And then with new buildings, obviously you've got more of an opportunity to be to, to create new spaces and, and use new ideas. And, and this all starts with collaboration at the design stage. So thinking about how to build in biophilic principles when designing buildings. So first off, if we're talking about existing spaces, what can be done to, to, to bring biophilia into existing spaces? Well, there are lots of surfaces. There's, there's, there's um, You've got you've got carpets, you've got wall spaces, um, uh, cubicle doors, window safety manifestations. So down there on the right, make, creating creating those the, the the stickers or the etchings on on on, on glass for safety could be could be biophilic shapes. You could put murals on walls. You could put stickers on walls. You can use furniture and equipment with natural shapes and and fractals and and use use uh, furniture which is perhaps made from made from wood rather than plastic. So very simple things that, that don't cost the earth. Bringing plants into classrooms can, can have a big impact. Um, this was, this was a, a study that just, just, just created a classroom with plants and compared outcomes to classroom without plants. And it found that students in the classrooms with plants scored, scored their experience more highly in terms of preference, comfort and friendliness. Uh, they also had fewer sick days and punishment records than those in a regular classroom. And what they concluded in this study was that the benefits were tied to mental health and behaviour. So bringing in a few pot plants, um, we have a, uh, we, 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 as part of our tree planting programme, we provide a pack to schools um, that we're working with, with acorns to grow. Just putting in, putting in a few acorns in pots that you can grow in a, cl grow in a classroom, things like that, small touches can make a big difference. Uh, there's, a, there's an organization in the US called a Plant in Every Classroom, and they provide US schools with indoor plants. And they claim that re the research shows that just 40 seconds of viewing plant helps ease stress and improve uh, focus and attention. So there are simple things you can do in existing spaces. Um, and then obviously we're a, we're a, a construction company. I wanted to look at what you can do with new builds. And here, obviously, there's there's you've you've got a you've got a, a, a very open can a very very open canvas, um, and these are just some some basic principles to think about. Now we we know that physical access to the outdoors helps improve discipline and risk taking creativity. And experience those sights and sounds of nature are really positive. So you know a simple thought is provide doors from every classroom where possible. Obviously, on the ground floor, less easy 
on the second or third floor. But if you can provide access for, from an individual classroom, what, how, what we find is, and, and we, we do this wherever we can in our bills, what we find is that uh, the teachers are far more likely to use those doors and to take children outside uh, more frequently than they would be if they have to move through corridors and move through other spaces. Um, CO2, you know, high levels of CO2 are known to reduce cognitive performance. So building in adaptive ventilation means that you keep the air as fresh and natural as it can be while maintaining thermal comfort and removing the pollutants that are obviously increasingly important today. Um, and these adaptive ventilators, they use, they use natural air, they, they use air from outside, they use the warmth from inside, and they adapt depending on the seasons. They have different modes of operation from summer, autumn and winter. <clears throat> and it means that you're maximising the amount of fresh air in a room, which is, which is good for, for everyone. Uh, natural light, exposure to natural light is, is, is really important. Um, it, it, it stimulates serotonin. It's vital for digestive health and helps, as I've mentioned, reduce myopia and improve well-being. So when designing spaces, think about floor to ceiling windows. Um, where possible, think about adding in sun pipes um, that can pipe sunlight directly in from the outside. Automated lighting controls can help optimize the natural light. So it means that when there's enough natural light, that the, the, the lighting inside can dim. So you've got less artificial than that. You've got the minimum amount of artificial light that you need to light the actual space. These are just some thoughts from um, from our architects. Just thinking about you know, if, if you were to design a building purely on biophilic principles, what might you do? Well, you might pr provide decking that's partitioned with different spaces. You might make it protrude into the landscape. Putting balustrades, use, use a, a fin design for balustrades, have a more natural feel to them. Um, perhaps add pergolas to, to the canopy for, for varying light. Uh, maybe adding in cables that plants can grow on um, or astroturf. Uh, put a rainwater collection around a building so that you've got water continually being caught putting in a dovecot and apertures for views of the landscape, a planter perhaps, and different seating areas so that children can, uh, during break times, can, can, can sit in different areas and, and have different perspectives uh, of, the, of the natural world outside. You can create inter internal areas <clears throat> that, that um, encourage people to engage with the with with the natural world through views of nature through a window. So this is an example whereby creating an interior window seating area will encourage students to, to sit there and stare out of the window. Um, you know, I'm sure I'm sure we've all had experiences being at school where we've been told to stop daydreaming. Well, actually, staring out the window every now and then is going to be good for you. Um, this was this was an interesting experience that we had last year. Um, we ran a, a, a design competition um, in association with Head Teacher Update magazine and Secad magazine, and we ran it across um, across all the key stages. And we had um, we had th these two were, were the win were winners in key stage two and in key stage three, as it happens. And these these pupils were asked to design an outdoor learning space. So obviously, it's fundamentally in, in the world of nature. But what I thought was interesting about their designs was how, 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 they, how natural they seemed to be, how, how they were following shapes in nature, um, curved surfaces, using, using, using green roofs, um, using um, a beehive shapes and honeycomb shapes. And so, so for me, it just, it just showed me that, that ch you know, young children when asked to think about designing in the natural world, they're, they're naturally using the inspiration of nature to design with, um, which for me comes back to that uh, biophilic, we, we have fundamental needs to connect with nature because it, it's built within us. So just to finish off, um, we, we provide buildings that are built from in the main, well, t on, all on timber frame and using a lot of, a lot of timber cladding and, and, and canopies. And we provide access to the outdoors and natural light. So we do research amongst our customers um, quite regularly, just asking for feedback on how the buildings work for them and what benefits they find and, and how the children react to being in these types of buildings. So I just share with you some of the findings from that research. 
Um, and what we find in, in general is that the, the environments increase people's willingness to learn uh, and improve results and aspirations. And they also have a positive impact on well-being, and not just of the students, but of the teachers as well. Um, and I'll just, I'm just going to run through uh, a, few, a few examples of, of these verbatim quotes of the impact of these buildings in particular spaces. Um, so this is um, a site, this is an early years setting at Bickley Park. Both children and staff love learning and work in the building due to the amount of natural light and space. Free flow access to the covered deck is a great advantage so they can have outdoor learning in all weathers. This is a, um, a special school um, in the Shires. Uh, the, the design of our new building allows us to fully embrace learning without walls by offering direct access to the outdoor space from every classroom. So it's an example of where a building provides, provides the, the students within it to be able to get out whenever they want to. Uh, this is from a primary setting in Wales. We've seen a big improvement in their behaviour. They're much calmer. Something we think might be due to the natural light they have, which was not available in the previous room. Both children and staff have really enjoyed working in the new classroom with easy access to the outdoors for play, and we've also saved on energy costs. Giving the children new settings of learning has had a big impact on motivation. Working amongst natural surroundings has enhanced the imagination and creativity. So that's a direct verbatim from research amongst this is uh, a school in Surrey. This is, this is a theme that we hear a fair, a fair bit. The environment seems settled and calm. Children are able to focus on their learning. It has a very positive impact on staff well-being. And a similar point, our pupils feel valued and like the roominess and light of their new learning space. The Cedar building also has a warmth that's hard to put into words, but basically they feel comfortable. One of the things we find about these spaces, which use a lot of natural materials, natural light and access to the outdoors, is people describe them as having a different feel to them, to the main building. It's a different type of space. And sometimes they can't put it into words. Um, but I think it's coming right down to these principles of biophilic design. And one final point, just to, um, just to finish on. I think, hopefully, I've, I've, I've shown how important connecting with nature is for our health and our well-being, as well as educational outcomes. So for us, therefore, preserving it is really important. We've got to think about how we're building and how we're living with the environment and how we take care of it. So when thinking about the types of spaces that, that we're designing, it's important to think about the materials you're using. So using timber is very advantageous because it, 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 it not only is great from a biophilic pr principle, but it, it also creates buildings with a carbon store effect. So it's actually getting one step closer to that net zero ambition. And reducing concrete foundations through, through modern foundations is, is a big help. A fabric first approach of thinking about really efficient fabrics saves, saves us damaging the environment so much. Renewable energy, higher air tightness. So the more energy efficient our buildings can be, the, the better we are at preserving the environment. And increasingly, you know, we're focused on using, using natural materials actually takes us one step closer to achieving a net zero lifetime building because it has a much more positive uh, effect on the overall carbon uh, carbon lifetime use, carbon lifetime consumption. So, so, so creating buildings based on biophilic design groups using natural materials is not only good for us today, it's good for us in terms of preserving the environment for the future. So that is um, everything that I have to share with you today. Um, if you'd like to know more, please drop me a line, uh, mark at tgscapes.co.uk or visit the website where you'll find lots more case studies and, and examples of, of buildings that, that use these principles.